Whatever you think of the new U.S. president and his policies, it seems they may yield some unexpected results here in Canada. Exhibit A, as our universities tally and assess this year's crop of applications, the stack from south of the border is drawing particular attention. Is there a so-called Trump bump at play, or is the esteem of higher education in Canada on the rise for other reasons? To consider that, we are joined by Deb Matthews. She's Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development and a Liberal MP for London North Centre. Amit Chakma, President and Vice-Chancellor, Western University in London, Ontario. Rhonda Lenton, Vice President of Academic and Provost and the next President of York University. Charlotte Yates, Provost and VP Academic at the University of Guelph. And Richard Levin, Executive Director of Enrollment Services and University Registrar at the University of Toronto. And we are delighted to welcome everybody around our table here tonight for this discussion at TVO. I suspect protocol suggests I should go to you first. <laughs> However, uh, I find that when ministers speak first, everybody else then takes a particular <laughs> approach. Happy Whereas if you speak defer. last, they may say what they really think without being Let's overly go. influenced by you. So we're going to do that. Oh, and one more thing. Congratulations. You're going to be the next president Thank July you. 1st of York University. Thank so you. congrats to you, uh, Rhonda Lenton. Um, in the week after the U.S. election last November, uh, if you did a Google search of universities in Canada, in America, you'd have hit the highest level of interest in more than a decade. So we want to explore that. We've got four universities around this table. We have somebody who represents the whole post-secondary system here. Charlotte, to you first. What has happened with U.S. student interest at your university since the election last November? So it's interesting because we have definitely seen an increase in the number of applications and the expressions of interest, particularly at the undergraduate, less so at the graduate, although uh, particular stories around the graduates. So some increase uh, with regards to the vet medicine uh, program, we've actually seen a 100% increase. Uh, I think that's only partly related to Trump. I think there are other factors which are influencing that, not the least of which are the low value of the Canadian dollar. And it sounds odd, but the evidence we're getting is Canada's educational profile, the excellence of it, has been boosted by the high profile of our Prime Minister who promotes Canada, and we're actually seeing that filter through as well. So there's both a reaction to the environment in the United States, but also a building of that positive profile for Canadian education as an alternative. And lots to unpack as we go along there. Richard Levin, what are you finding at the U of T? So the first thing we noticed was um, a big spike in web traffic right at the time of the election. So we were getting about 1,000 visits from U.S. students before November uh, 9th. And on November 9th, it hit 10,000. And you could see it bump right up around midnight, uh, just as the election results Seriously. became clear. Yeah, it was that clear. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, receded a little bit, but still elevated. In terms of applications, and I, I should say that we've been active recruiting in the U.S. for some years. and. Um, We've, um, we've made additional efforts in the past couple of years. So it's probably not all the external circumstances, but we have seen an 80% increase in um, applications from U.S. students this year. You had Mr. Saturday Night Live doing an event for you in New York recently. Uh, we did. We've been, <laughs> we've been having some uh, events in the U.S. We have one coming up in Bethesda, so we are attracting a lot of interest. That was Lauren Michaels. Lauren Michaels. Who went to That's you, right. Too. And uh, following that, we had Don Harrison from Google um, for us in um, California. Gotcha. Madam incoming president, what are you seeing at York? Well, we similarly have been seeing an increase as well. And it was interesting, we saw exactly the same pattern right after this huge increase uh, in the U.S. by 137% on the web page. Uh, we've got about a 47% increase now in U.S. applications. But I think what's really interesting is that we're not just seeing the impact in terms of the increase in applications from the U.S., but it's had a broader impact in terms of our increase in applications from uh, other leading countries. And so overall, we've seen in one year since last year a 37% increase in international applications. And it's a huge opportunity for us because Canada itself has got uh, you know international education strategy. We want to increase that number to over 450,000 students by 2022. And this is an opportunity for us to really be advancing our own strategy and taking you know, advantage of the opportunity. What are you seeing in Western? Well, we have seen a bump in international student applications, but we are bucking the trend uh, on the uh, American side. 
Uh, we haven't seen uh, much movement, partly because we haven't made the uh, U.S. a focus of our efforts in terms of recruiting. So we're uh, holding steady. Do you want to make America more of a focus? Uh, yes, uh, we would like to have more U.S. students to come here, but our focus is really uh, more global. Uh, we would like to have a diverse student body, and we get uh, greater diversity if we bring students you know, that are not from North America. Minister, do you think Donald Trump represents an opportunity for the post-secondary system in this province? I don't think there's any question that there are people, some in the States, but uh, as Rhonda said, internationally, people who, who just aren't feeling comfortable going to the United States. They see more risks attached to that decision for themselves, for their family. So we are seeing, we saw a 30% increase in the number of applicants internationally this year over last, huge increase. Uh, we did see an increase of 12% province-wide from the states, but uh, I think there are a lot of people in parts of the country and parts of the world who are feeling that uh, their safety may be, they don't, won't feel as comfortable in the states as they may have before. So is it an opportunity for us? Absolutely. Our international students, we've doubled the number of international students over the past five years. So it's a big and growing part of our student population. I think we have to make sure that those students have a terrific experience while they're here, because uh, word of mouth is uh, the biggest uh, factor there is. So some of this is Donald Trump, presumably. But I, but, I don't but think you, there's any question about that. But if you're interested in coming to Ontario from Brazil or Malaysia or China, that's got nothing to do with Donald Trump, really, does it? Well, it depends on who you are, um, but I would say from the Middle East, and we're seeing a significant increase from the Middle East, we're seeing Muslim students from India who are not comfortable uh, thinking about the state. So, yeah, I think it has broader implications than just from the U.S. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, our, uh, our India numbers are up, our India applications are up 60% this year. Our UAE applications are up 50. Our applications from Turkey are up 70. So uh, a lot of people are looking at other possibilities, and I think that's a great thing. You know, external circumstances change. They change, they change back. So anything that gets people looking at other possibilities uh, in a very global world is a great thing. What about for York University? York has a strong Muslim student base. Are you hearing anything about, we don't feel comfortable going to the States, therefore we're taking a second look at York? You know, I think it's more about the positive impact um, on how students view Canada. I think that what's happening in the U.S. really shines a light on Canada's commitment to inclusivity and diversity. I know at York University and many other uh, universities in Canada, we're very committed to being inclusive, to attracting international students. We're known to be approachable, to be a safe society. So I think it's the contrast about what really is now shedding light on Canada and attracting international students to think about Canada as an alternative. Let's, we talked about students mostly here, but I want to also talk about faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. Do you see any uptick in interest from American faculty and or staff to come here as a Absolutely. result of the political situation down there? And not to make light of it, but if I say the day after the election, the number of American faculty phoning us who had friends or saying, do you have any positions now or any time in the near future? Only partly speaking in jest. So we have seen a growth in the number of applications for our faculty jobs. Staff less so, and I would say partly because, except in certain positions, we tend to recruit staff um, from more the kind of region. But certainly faculty, and oddly enough, I mean, just to go back a little bit, we also have seen a spike of interest by Mexico. Uh, because, of course, feeling that they are, their natural pattern from many of the private schools in Mexico was to move into the United States. They're now thinking that that's not a viable option for them. And so building on the relationships that we already have there. So we've seen faculty, students, and we've also seen graduate students who are, in fact, Muslim or who are visible minorities contacting us to shift their graduate program in midstream because they're worried that if the travel ban comes into place, if they go to an international conference, will they be at risk of not being able to get back, therefore having their studies interrupted? So it's a multifaceted story. We do know President Chakma 45, 50 years ago, that Canada, I guess, benefited is the right word, from a, a big American exodus, people trying to avoid the draft from the Vietnam War. Many researchers, professors, and so on, students came up here. 
Do you see something like that happening here as it relates to faculty and staff this time? I, I wouldn't uh, draw that parallel as yet. It all depends on what the U.S. government does. Uh, you probably picked up the news that uh, the president is proposing to reduce NIH budget by $6 billion. National Institutes of Health. Right, National Institutes of Health. Should that happen? You know, clearly, you know, there'll be an opportunity for us and other countries you know, to try to recruit talents from you know, those who would not feel as uh, supported in their current environment in these states. Can I put it a, a little more crassly? Do you hope things deteriorate there more because we stand to benefit? Uh, uh, the, the answer, I may surprise you, is no, because we, uh, in the creation of knowledge, we are part of a global system. When uh, any of our, you know, sister jurisdictions, you know, take the wrong path, uh, you know, that kind of drags the whole system down. So I wouldn't be cherishing that opportunity, but if the opportunity presents, uh, obviously, representing my university, representing Canada, we would like to build our own talent pool. Okay, he's obviously a, a diplomat and an academic, and therefore he has one particular way of looking at it. You're in politics. You're allowed to take a more brass knuckles approach. Do you hope things deteriorate there more because we potentially benefit? Uh, no, I have to say, really, no? absolutely not. Really? If there's an opportunity, as uh, Ahmad has said, we are there. Uh, and we are benefiting from that, but I would much rather see um, the United States be in a place where everybody feels safe and welcome and uh, and appreciated. And so, I uh, I would, as I say, it does present an opportunity for us. <laughs> it does, but I have to say we've been working really hard on international on attracting more international students for a long time, and we are seeing the benefits. Uh, I am a, um, you know, my favorite song, Steve, is uh, It's a Small World, after all. <laughs> I'd like us to all right. hold hands and love each other. That is a better world. Yeah, guess what? Uh, that, that's not on for the next three and a half years. I think you know that. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I'm not being a complete smart aleck when I ask the question yeah. this way, but the fact is the United States looks like it's taken a particular yeah. political course right now. and. I guess what I'm picking up here is do you need to be a bit careful about how you exploit the political situation down there for what potentially is our gain? I think that we have, uh, I think Richard, you were quoted as having said, uh, Canada is having a bit of a moment. Uh, I was down in New York to see the opening of Come From Away. Mm. Uh, I, mean, I think there are a lot of good things happening. Our prime minister Absolutely. is really doing us proud, the photographs of he and uh, and Kathleen Wynne welcoming Syrian um, immigrants, refugees, that sent a really strong and powerful uh, signal. So we're here. We're a great place uh, to come for, for a university education and a college education. Um, we've, uh, we're, we're proud of our inclusivity and our diversity, and uh, so we are here to welcome people who might not feel welcome elsewhere. Richard, do you have to be careful in the way you put the welcome mat out, lest you look like you're exploiting political turmoil down there? Well, I think that, um, you know, as, as was said earlier, anything that presents an opportunity for people to look around a little bit more and consider their, their options is a good thing. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we have been active. We were active a couple of years ago and we're, we've been growing that activity. I think we're at Toronto, we were very optimistic about our opportunities uh, in the United States. We have, you know, we have fantastic colleagues. I learn all the time from my American colleagues and I, I, I truly do wish them well and I don't want to see them hurt by these activities. Um, but I also think it's just a very good thing for everybody. It's, it's a good thing for our domestic students because, um, you know, not all of them can go away on an international experience, and instead the world comes to them. You know, and at U of T, one in five students is international, so you sit in a classroom and you get the benefit of that experience. Um, and it's good for the United States in the end because their students get an international experience too. And you know, administrations will come and go, but that those connections and that knowledge will benefit the country for years. And it's also great for our economy. International students hmm. bring about $3 billion a year in tuition, food, lodging. It's a big, it's a big revenue generator. It's a hmm. big part of our economy Well, here. they pay more, don't they? Yes, they do pay more. When they come 
from there to here, they don't pay the same tuition as people who are from Ontario they pay. They pay significantly more. Yeah. They pay significantly less than if they were to go to a U.S. university, mm -hmm. about half. But, um, but it's, it's, it's a good part of our economy as well. Let us uh, expand our discussion then and talk about the bigger brand that all of you are partners in trying to build, namely the province of Ontario's Canadian universities and how they are viewed by the rest of the world. And uh, Sheldon, let's bring up this graphic here. According to the 2016-17 Times Higher Education World University Rankings, in this country we have three universities in the top 50 in the world. Uh, one of them might be at this table. We have 11 in the top 250. We have 17 in the top 400. And of those 17, eight of them are in the province of Ontario. Four of those top 400 universities in the world are, in fact, represented around this table here, U of T, Western, York, Guelph. Those are the rankings, but let's get, uh, let's scratch a little below the surface here. How well regarded do you think our universities are internationally? I think our universities are under-recognized internationally or have historically been under-recognized, notwithstanding the fact we have really high levels of, we have high quality education across the country. And it's it, for many, many reasons that we built not just research intensive, student focused universities where the outcomes of that education on all measures are absolutely fantastic. So I find it somewhat surprising when people don't know more about us, including the top universities of the country. So I think we're like, we hide our light a little under a bushel. And I think that what's changing is that I think the recognition of Canada, and I do think this has to do with partly national and provincial politics. As it's played out over the last year, 18 months, there's been a sense that Canada is an important player on the world scene. We represent a unique set of values around diversity, around, and that includes diversity of thought, which is absolutely critical to the universities here in Canada. So I didn't by see doing much of that so, at McGill last week, but anyway, we can well, move on. Well, we, we don't have to yeah. discuss that today, yeah. but that notion of diversity of thought, that debate, that notion that on campus we are building inclusive campuses. I think that as our national government begins to profile us as a country that is positioned internationally to broker important relationships, suddenly people are looking at Canada and saying, oh, we may be overlooked you. And then when they dig into the rankings, they realize how strong we are, what an incredibly positive environment. I think there's also an element that diversity is being recognized as a part of the global economy. Companies are also being attracted to Ontario for that reason. They want to recruit the best, and the only way they can is if they're positioned in a country where the best come here. Let me so there's up. a dynamic there. Let me follow up with Ronald Lenton on that. Do you think we've got a good story to tell, but nobody knows it? Well, I think it's improving. You know, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, branding can be incredibly important. You know, there was an EDU Canada branding in um, between 2007 and 2012, and the um, increase in international applications during that period of time went up 51%. So branding can have a huge impact, and the you know um, the Canada's international education strategy really talks about the importance of uh, of branding. I, I have to agree a little bit that I do think that given how. Uh, how, how highly ranked Canada is. I mean, the majority of our, of our population has either a diploma or a degree um, in terms of their education. That ranks us very high. We've got, as you've said, some of the top ranked universities in Canada. So I actually do think that our reputation, our brand should be a bit better than it is right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would note that Canada um, is, has the greatest proportion of increase in international right now. So it's a proportion of our own base. You're starting to see that increase to Canada. So I'm optimistic, I think, over the next period of time. And I do think that it is that commitment to inclusivity and diversity that we're safe, that we put a high premium on higher education, that it is uh, Canada is known for the quality of our education. Known but not known as much as it perhaps ought to be. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I, I, I've been doing a bit of <clears throat> traveling. I was in China, I was in um, the UAE, in Qatar. And I can tell you, people that I met with are very, very high on our, on our post-secondary education here. And a lot of it is word of mouth. People hear anecdotally about people who had a good experience. So the, as we increase the number of students here, that will just uh, uh, continue to grow. 
I, I actually think we have a terrific reputation, and uh, we're seeing that. And, you know, the, the EU, EU students looking for an English-speaking experience, Canada is now number one. But if that's the case, why aren't we getting a bigger chunk of the international student choice? Well, we are, and it's growing. Um, can we do more? Is there opportunity to, more, to do more? Absolutely there is. And I think all of our institutions are, are, are focusing on that. Um, and, I, and I think a question that I'd be interested in hearing is can we do more as Ontario? Can we do more as Canada? Currently, we, for the most part, leave it up to institutions to do their own recruiting. Would we be stronger if we did it as one? I think that's an important question. As one question. what? As one system? As one entity. As so one entity. That we, that we advertise Ontario. Which there's with. been, of course, an increase, actually, in the federal government's role in promoting it on the trade missions. There's been a growth in the last couple of years in promoting education as part of those trade missions. So one wonders if part of the ongoing increase may be at least helped by those efforts. President Chuckman, what do you think? I think the minister is right. I think uh, we have many, many strengths. Uh, my way of uh, looking at the strengths we have, uh, notwithstanding that we have only three universities in the top 50, overall quality of education in Canada, from schools to universities, is very good. We may not have too many in the top 10, top 20, but overall quality is extremely good. Second one, of course, others have talked about, welcoming nature of our country. And the third one, uh, which is equally important, value for money. The uh, minister made little reference to it. Uh, it is actually cheaper to come uh, to Canada to study. So those are uh, the value propositions. So what is missing is a national effort. You know, we, we are doing a better job than we did in the past. Uh, Rhonda mentioned uh, the growth, uh, but we need to do a much better job. Uh, the problem we have is a structural one. We don't have a department or a minister at the federal level, you know, who kind of represent us internationally, uh, looking after education. That's because post-secondary education is a provincial responsibility. Right. You know, the, the wonderful uh, you know, leader who created TVO, Bill Davis, Premier Davis, once told me, when people uh, tell you that it's about constitution, that means that they don't really want to do it. So there are ways, <laughs> so there are ways of, I think, working together, notwithstanding our hmm. constitutional arrangement. So I agree with the minister. What we need to do is make it a priority and go at it, work together, and brand the country as opposed to just branding the institutions. Well, let me ask a mischievous question to our friend from the University of Toronto here, which is you're, you're one of the institutions that's on that very select list right. of the best in the world. Right. So you're pushing the U of T brand. We are. And I wonder whether the University of Toronto, you know, gives a damn about pushing Brock or pushing <laughs> Windsor or pushing Carleton or, you know what I'm saying? Like, is, is well, it your interest to push the whole system I, or just yours? I think it's an interplay between institutional effort and collective effort. And there are, um, there are occasions when collective effort makes a lot of sense. We do some work with, for example, uh, McGill and UBC in India. We recruit <laughs> together. So, and I think we've together raised the total number of applicants. Um, but, you know, if you think of the U.S., which has a, a tremendous international brand, that came about from their institutions. And you constantly hear about Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and Stanford on American media. Yep. So um, there is, I think there is a role for branding. There's especially a role for branding around the attributes of Canada, as some of my colleagues have said, um, tolerance, safety, stability. Um, a welcoming environment, inclusiveness, those are important things, and we do focus on those things. Uh, diversity of Toronto has been a very big message for us um, in many countries. So, um, you know, these are the things that I think we can continue to focus on. Let me ask the two of you on either side of me here about another country and whether they're eating our lunch on this, because mm. I, one does hear that Australia Absolutely. does a much better job than mm. Canada does reaching out for international students, they get a bit of, bigger chunk of them and make mm -hmm. more money. Is that true? Yes, it's true. And it's partly, it's been a strategic priority for the Australian government for years. That, and in fact, it's one of their top exports is education. Now, they do it in a number of different ways. And it's quite different from, say, what Richard was, ex was describing. This is truly an export of education across multiple institutions. It is a priority, and, the, and they work hand in glove, government and universities. But also, it's big business for universities. And that, I think, there would be considerable debate 
with, and has been in Canada about whether that should be the priority of Canadian universities. So I think there's a little bit of one needs to balance about whether that route is the best route to go, which is very much about producing uh, kind of uh, general revenue for the country by exporting education, as opposed to figuring out why are we pursuing international students and international faculty? And I think it's actually to improve our research excellence, to improve the global, uh, I suppose, understanding both of our own students, but also of students from away, about their place in the global world. And I'm not sure that it's primarily driven by an economic agenda. There is much more of that interweaving in the Australian agenda. So I, I would be cautious about us, even though they are eating our lunch in terms of pure numbers. Are they? They certainly have more international students. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about, they're at about 30 percent, I believe. Um, and we're at about uh, 13, mm -hmm. I think, overall. So they're beating us. Yes, they are. And is that good? You know, I think we've got a lot to learn from Australia. Mm -hmm. And one is that the quality of the experience mm -hmm. matters. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, Australian story has not been all positive, And there have been serious allegations of, uh, of racism within, within that sector. So I think it, it really reminds us that uh, international students are not cash cows. Mm -hmm. um, they are future Canadians. And we have to treat, treat them like future Canadians because many of them do go on. And uh, the experience that they have here matters. It matters through reputation. There's, there can be significant reputational um, implications if they don't have a high quality experience. So, I mean, we talk a lot about being inclusive and welcoming. And, you know, I, I think we actually have to check ourselves sometimes and really ask ourselves, are we really being what we say we want to be? Do mm. students, do international students feel that way? Uh, and uh, I think that has to be an ongoing, mm -hmm. ongoing question for international students and for other student groups that are unre underrepresented, like Indigenous students, right? Are we really, do, are we really doing what we, we want to be doing on that I, I think it's critical that we can support, um, we can support well the international students we attract and that we don't get into that um, kind of issue uh, because it is, um, you know, there's a big reputational element associated with that. Uh, not to diminish Australia's achievements, but they are extremely close to a very, very large market. Um, <laughs> you know, and they're doing very well in Asia. They gave uh, and continue to give scholarships to students in Asia. Um, so they do have certain advantages. Notwithstanding all of those, Steve, I would say that uh, they have done a very good job uh, in promoting uh, what uh, we haven't talked about is. Uh, that they have uh, been able to improve the quality of their institutions. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at number of Australian universities in the top 100, mm -hmm. you'll find that you know, they're much smaller than we are, but uh, they managed to use international education to build quality of their institutions. So I think you can achieve both. And I look to state of Victoria, uh, much smaller, you know, less than half the size of Ontario. Mm -hmm. They have more international students than we do. And they boast, you know, at least two uh, uh, top universities uh, in the world. So they do have some geographic advantages over us, obviously proximity to China, for example. But have they made it a higher priority to reach out so. to more international yes, students and be better at it than us? Yeah, and I think they have. And I think that also in terms of the collaboration that you see taking place in the country uh, and the particular initiatives that have come out of that. And I think Canada could be doing better in thinking about how we are collaborating, both institutions of higher education, but how federal and provincial government and the private sector are collaborating. We need to raise the visibility of Canada, uh, you know, internationally. It's, I think it's quite um, revealing about the percentage of Canadian students who actually go to get an international experience elsewhere. We are nowhere near the percentage that we should be at. You know, it's over, it's over 3%. We should be closer to 15%. And this is all contributing to the visibility. And there's a great opportunity, I think, for the kind of consortia effort that you see in Australia um, to raise the visibility together. I, I totally agree that quality, you've got to be focusing on quality. But there are opportunities for that. And you see also national uh, programs around student support. So the Columba, Columbo plan in Australia, um, the amount of money that are being made available for students who are actually both coming incoming, but also students who want an international placement, faculty members who want to uh, have a, an international opportunity at another university. 
these kinds of initiatives are incredibly important. You know, in, in Canada at a federal level, we have the Canadian Research Excellence Fund. We have to think about this from a research point of view as well. The Canadian government making available funds in order to create pockets of research excellence where we are becoming leaders in, you know, around the world. Uh, York University got money to become a leader in vision research. So, uh, you know, so the, all these kinds of collaborative efforts, these are incredibly important to raising the visibility of Canada. Uh, you know, two students who are interested in an in international experience. Let me ask the minister a question that I suspect a lot of parents and students, parents of grade 12s and students who are in grade 12 probably wonder, which is in our effort to achieve a higher percentage of international students, might that come at the expense of those who are here and living in the province of Ontario who've been paying their taxes for years and who want to make darn sure that little Janie or Johnny's got a spot waiting for them? Yeah, Does absolutely. one jeopardize the other? So I'm going to take a minute with this. Mm -hmm. um, we have a college and university system that is publicly funded to serve Ontario students, domestic students. Um, that is the raison d'etre of our institutions. International students add a whole lot of uh, richness to that experience on many levels. But are we committed to make sure that every qualified Ontario student gets a spot in a, in a university in college or college in Ontario? We absolutely are. You may feel so, that way in terms of policy, but these universities, I, I bet you, would love to have a higher paying foreign student than a, than a lower paying domestic student. Well, you know, what's really interesting is that... That was nasty to say, but I bet somewhere you all feel that way. Okay. But, um, you know, we talk about sort of the overall provincial average. It varies enormously from institution to institution. So, Guelph, I think you've got about 3% of your students are international. of undergrad. Yeah. Of undergrad, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we heard U of T is about 20. That's right. Uh, so, uh, so not every student in Ontario is getting that same uh, experience with international students. And one of the things I'd like to do is talk about ways to increase the number of international students across the board. Mm -hmm. There is no question that universities are able to do what they do in part because of the revenue they get from international students. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not impacting the ability of an Ontario student to get a university well, education. Well, that's what I want to know. I mean, Richard, is it the case that the University of Toronto might say, let's just stick a few more international students in that class. We need their revenue. And if it means that students who've been brought up and raised in the province of Ontario have to have more crowded classrooms as a result, it's the price you have to pay. Oh, I think we want to um, we want to recruit the best students we can, and we ha certainly have a commitment to um, to students in Ontario and Canada, and we are accepting. I would say every student who domestic student who's qualified at uh, what we consider to be the threshold for the University of Toronto. So um, you know I, I don't see it in those terms, and we have pretty much reached the threshold in terms of incoming students for internationals. So once we hit the point where we feel uh, we don't want to expand because we can't guarantee that we'll provide as good a service as we need to, we're stopping. President Shockman, let me ask you this. Are you concerned at all that your university, as an example, might be taking in too many foreign students from one particular country and or region of the world rather than a more broadly based student we, body? I would like to have broad based uh, students, uh, but uh, uh, we started with such a low number, 3% uh, or less in our first year class. Our priority number one was to bring in international students. Uh, we would like to diversify that body, and uh, it, it takes time. And we do it uh, in many different ways. So the topic that you're discussing is really bringing undergraduate students to study in our universities for four years. But we also have a large number of students who come to us, particularly from Europe, as exchange students. So when you look at the mix, actually our student body is reasonably diverse. And let me return to your question that you asked the minister, how we did it at Western. Uh, we suddenly take our commitment to Ontario seriously. So we added about 1,000 spots in our first year over the last five years. Guess what happened? 500 of those incremental spots went to international students, 500 domestic students. And you could not have done it without the revenues that we generated by bringing in international students. In our case, I suspect it'll be the case in many other places, international students actually allowed us to expand 
opportunities for domestic students. So you can actually achieve both. Do you, Charlotte Yates, worry about uh, Guelph taking a disproportionate amount of students from one particular country or region of the world to the exclusion of others? We're certainly very conscious that that's a potential impact and as a result our recruitment strategies we're quite self-conscious in uh, how we recruit so that we do achieve that balance because the whole goal of that international recruitment is if those students can come onto campus, have a great experience, get to know uh, other Canadian students and they tell us they want to know other Canadian students so as a result that diversity is very important, so we're self quite self-conscious, and in fact, we may be small, but our students actually come from 100 different countries, so we're quite diverse. And then we meld that, I would say, with a deep commitment to access. So uh, we have a number of access initiatives to ensure that Canadians from rural, northern, uh, Aboriginal, Inuit uh, communities come in but it's not at the exclusion of the international. But just, just for the heck of it, and I'm just going to pick China because we've been talking yeah. about it. If you had 2,000 new students come from China next mm. year, uh, and, mm -hmm. and that represented 90% of your increase mm -hmm. in foreign students, would that be good or bad? That would, that would pose a particular set of challenges. It wouldn't be bad because if they were great students, but we'd have to work hard at making sure they felt part of the campus and that they felt integrated because what happens often is um, when you have a large sudden influx from one particular place, then naturally uh, you gravitate towards people who may come from your own community and so <laughs> on, and that may actually short not it, your experience won't be as enriched you don't get the mix no exactly no. and so that's why for us we're so self-conscious of our strategy so that we don't mm. actually have that but have it from a wide range of countries can i get you on that ronda lenton you know i think it's really important to think about the reasons why you want a broad base you know a country like china is investing very heavily in their own educational infrastructure so from a you know, Canadian perspective, you do not want to be too dependent on any particular country. But it really goes to the point that Charlotte raised. It's about what we're trying to accomplish. We're really trying to accomplish that diversity, that richness of experience. So we want students from a broad spectrum of different countries so that we can ensure that our students are getting that experience. And we want our students, the Canadian students, to go to a broad variety of also of different countries. So you want to have different partnerships so that those students have the opportunity and faculty have the opportunity for, from those different you know it's not it's also it's not only about the economic um, people we've been focused here on the economic uh, contribution the fact of the matter is is that we get you know grant money we get government money for domestic students we don't mm. get uh, grant money for international students it's only fees we obviously have to ensure that we're providing really good resources for international students so it's about the contribution that those students are making to the culture to the social well-being to the health of the of the society I got 20 seconds left for you to have the last word on this should you want it well I, I do actually think it's it is a concern about almost half of our international students come from one country, from China. Um, any kind of change in policy from that country, and we've seen it before with Saudi Arabia has changed its policies on international students. That would be very disruptive to all of our institutions if there were to be a change in policy. So would I like to see a, a, a broader um, a contribution to our international students from different countries? I absolutely would. Gotcha. I want to thank everybody for coming into TVO tonight, sharing your views around our table here. How about a nice wide shot, Mr. Director, so that we can just say a group thank you to one and all. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank everybody. you very much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.